blessings on this new day that has begun. I've been here, you know, enjoying this evening devotion format and the task that I was given. So, in the sense that I now understand already on the second day why this had to go this way. Because then, when I, in a way, got to freely choose the topic of my own evening devotion, I could choose in a way those things that were easy or interesting at that moment. Now, as we proceed in a certain format, I noticed that I have been able to study more deeply these meanings and actually converse with God to understand what this might mean, what similarities are found now when we read everything chronologically from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And today we will read or look through the book of Moses further. So the first book of Moses, Genesis, chapters 4 to 7. And the most essential thing in these chapters 4 and 7 is, of course, Noah and the flood. Then here is quite an interesting similarity to this fourth chapter, when we start getting to know Cain and Abel and what happened there. And then, in what way are these things brought up in the 17th chapter of Luke's Gospel? What did Jesus say about forgiveness? And somehow, when you see this big difference between these books, the old and the new, in my opinion, it shows the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. And now in this book of Moses, there is the first covenant that God makes with humans. God makes the first covenant with Noah, and what does that mean? But let's then go on to Moses. In this way, and so forgive me, I'm not at all now a biblical scholar, but more of an enthusiastic, humble student, so I want to emphasize again that I am really not a Bible teacher. In my opinion, it's important to trust in what I also received, encouragement and guidance from other teachers, who I myself follow, and who have provided support for reading the Bible. We should pray that the Holy Spirit opens up those meanings to you, because through the Holy Spirit, we truly and genuinely learn to understand this Bible also in the contexts of our own lives. Just yesterday, it happened that I was talking with my wife in the evening, and we discussed a passage from the Old Testament. I think I was reading the Book of Kings then, and about King Solomon. There was a point that hit one thing we have been discussing together really well in today's context. So, the more I have familiarized myself with the Bible and dared to delve into it, the more it reveals about itself in a way that everything revealed and told to us in this Bible is completely valid and completely relevant in today's world. Therefore, there is no such thing as the Bible not working in today's world, so to speak. I have to say that there exists, you know, a kind of hypnosis produced by the enemy of the society's soul, especially in the Old Testament. And that same mass hypnosis is then fed by completely and utterly mistaken notions of what this God of the Old Testament is like. I myself believed for a long time that the God of the Old Testament is somehow really evil and almost rains down sulfur and fire on people. And it's completely the opposite because that same love and grace of God is completely present in this Old Testament, in the same way as in the New Testament. But let's now take a look at the fourth chapter of the book of Moses. When there is sin in a person, or a tendency to sin, that means that we easily become jealous of each other and pursue our own advantage. And here comes quite a severe matter of brotherly jealousy on the side of Cain and Abel. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. This is absolutely true. If we allow anger to take control, that is, if we remain in anger here in the Old Testament, God clearly and explicitly tells us that we must sit on top of that sin and rule over it. So it means what God has already promised and what Jesus has promised, that God will never give us a trial from which we cannot overcome, which we cannot face. But unfortunately, in this case, Cain is blinded by that anger and kills his own brother, and the Lord curses Cain but does not kill. In my opinion, here is an extremely important lesson. When it comes to an eye for an eye matter, God does not respond by killing more, but he curses Cain and Cain has to face the consequences of his actions. This is said in chapter 4 verse 15, For Cain will be avenged sevenfold, but Lemek seventy-seven times. Lemek was a descendant of Cain. Then we go back a little. Adam again joined his wife, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. Then Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. In this, it feels like we are choosing people on the side of good and evil. But let's not go there. But this, 
7 and 77. If we jump from here to the Gospel of Luke, and here comes a passage in the 17th chapter of Luke's Gospel. Beware, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. This is the most important teaching of Jesus in the New Covenant era, that is, the era of grace that Jesus brought among us. Forgive. Even if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times turns to you and says, I repent, forgive him. And Jesus has said that we should forgive our brother 77 times. In practice, endless forgiveness and these similarities in a certain way continue. Then there are these descendants up to Noah in the fifth chapter of Adam. Why are these descendants important? They are important because it has been desired to show, for example, that when Jesus is born, he is of the right descent, the right lineage. Perhaps notable here is that the lifespans have been immensely, immensely long. When Noah had lived 500 years, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then, the flood, chapter 6. Why is there a flood? And this kind of jumps around historically. We need to understand that context. So the world was under the influence of evil at that time. So Lucifer and his companions have been there, and many things have happened there. Not all of them have been left and put into this Bible. There are indeed other documents and prophecies, but they are not essential here. So here the Lord already sets a limit to human lifespan. My spirit will not dominate in humans forever, because they are only flesh. Therefore, let their time be 120 years. At that time and later, there were giants on the earth. When the sons of God had relations with human women who bore them children, these children became the famous heroes of ancient times. But the Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great on the earth. So, at that time on the earth, there were not only humans, but there were giants, and also other undefined monsters and beings. And the pace was shocking, to put it plainly. At that moment, the Lord regretted that he had made humans on the earth, and his heart was filled with sadness. Filled with sadness. I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. I will destroy both them and the animals, including the birds in the sky. I regret that I have made them. However, there was one blameless man. Yet Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the family records of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Even then God recognized that whoever walks in his presence will be saved. And God made a covenant with Noah and gave him instructions on how Noah would survive the flood and on how large an ark Noah should build and how it should be placed precisely and accurately. And in fact, just from these places described in the Bible, a formation resembling a petrified structure has been found on Mount Ararat, you know, with dimensions that match those of Noah's Ark. You can find, you know, I think by googling pictures and other things, but a place has been found, which is thought to be specifically the location of Noah's Ark. And it has been calculated that with these measurements, these animal species would have fit into that Ark just as God has, so to speak, ordained. People don't really want to talk about these things, because it would be quite unsettling that these things might actually be true. In the seventh chapter, after Noah did everything just as God had commanded him to do, therefore Noah abandoned his own will, believed in God's will. What was the reward? He got to save the whole world. Can there be a greater purpose for life? In our own way, when we surrender our will to God's will, we cannot know in advance how significant and great deeds we will do, which could save countless lives. And it's not the intention that we should aim for some indeterminate greatness or saving people's lives, but trust in God's plan, that even though it may sometimes feel difficult, it is the best for us. Even in my own life, it truly sometimes feels very painful and distressing. And I just can't understand at all how I will get through this, how to get these things sorted out. But God has always shown the means for every moment. I just have to give up my own desire to solve things, my own knowledge, my own striving, and pray for God's guidance. This is all encouragement ultimately also for the fact that God shows mercy to all who turn to him, all who respect him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood came upon the earth. And then we pretty much go to the end of that seventh chapter. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground. 
for I regret that I have made them. Genesis 6 7. Perhaps the biggest thing I myself got from this is that we must understand how important it is to try to hear the will of God. And if Noah heard it, why couldn't we hear it? Imagine if God now said that you have to start building an ark. In today's world, no chances. But concerning this flood, many Bible scholars have specifically talked and speculated that those, you know, kind of miscreants which were wiped out, they are the spirits wandering here on earth, guided by the devil and seeking a new home. The demonic spirits and demonic entities that I have studied from literature and the Bible and what I have seen that priests from different churches, even priests of the Catholic Church, encounter in their work, they are very much like, you know, brazen revelers, and that describes very well the world in which they lived at that time, very much in a very big sin. And equally, if we go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 17. So here is a very important understanding that even though we live in a new covenant, we must remain vigilant. So from verse 22 onwards, then Jesus says to his disciples, there will come a time when you will wish to see even one day of the Son of Man, but you will not see. You will be told, he is there or he is here. Do not go there and do not follow anyone. And now comes the similarity. And it's about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. But on the day when Lot left Sodom, fire and brimstone rained from heaven and destroyed them all. Likewise, it will be on the day when the Son of Man appears. So it's quite a harsh text. The same as in the time of Noah, the same as in the time of Lot. Everything that is not, well, whoever is not prepared. This is quite a tough thing and a very important matter. Why God, as Jesus has said, this is my opinion, when we follow Jesus, we must give up everything. Because if we have not given up everything, and if it happens that Jesus comes back in our lifetime, we cannot stay to watch what is left behind. Remember Lot's wife. She looked back. Despite the Lord's angel's warning, she turned into a pillar of salt. So, on that day, let the one who is on the roof and has belongings in the house not go down to get them, nor should the one in the field turn back. Whoever tries to secure their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life will save it. This also indicates that this world is upside down. You always receive what you give up, as the Finnish author Tommy Helston wisely wrote in his book, as Jesus has said, when you give up everything, you will receive back multiple times what you gave up. And that is a true statement. But do not assume that what you receive back originates from this world, but consider that what we also receive back in the Lord Jesus Christ is eternal life. Amen. There would surely be much more to say about this, but I still want to pray at the end. Thank you, Lord, for this new idea, evening devotions, and reading the Bible in all languages. Thank you for opening up this Old Testament and New Testament to each of us in our own way. I pray for gentle guidance for all of us in this week. And I pray, Jesus, your blood protection over all of us. I pray that we all remain vigilant and humble, joyful, eager for life. Because based on what I have learned about knowing you, this life does not have to be just crying and grinding of teeth. But when we trust in you, we will never be in distress. We can always be confident, and there is nothing to fear. So thank you, dear Jesus, for the grace you have given us all. I still pray that if someone wants to ask you now and give their life to you, dear Jesus, please answer and give your touch and that absolutely incredible security. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing us and being present in every moment. Amen. Thank you for this. More tomorrow. Please remember to like the video and subscribe to our channel. It helps us greatly in sharing the gospel. You can also support this Bible in a Year project in Patreon, and you can find the link to our Patreon channel from the description of this video. By supporting, you will make it possible for us to share the whole Bible in multiple languages. Thank you for this. Blessings and good night.